tanks form the shock force of modern armies, the iron fist with which 20th century generals batter down an enemy. A hundred years ago, it was the cavalry, mounted swordsmen or lancers, who rushed across the battlefield to deliver the decisive blow. On today's battlefields, like here in Israel on the Golan Heights, modern cavalrymen ride to the charge on tracks behind cannon and armor. Here on this Merkava, the Hebrew word for chariot, you can clearly see the three principles that have been fundamental to the concept of the tank from the beginning. Protection, firepower, and mobility. For protection, there's the armor plating, a foot or more thick here at the front end. Uniquely, this tank has its engine also in the nose as added protection for its crew. For firepower, there's the 105 millimeter gun, a weapon that can knock out another tank two miles away. There are also three heavy machine guns up there on top. Mobility is provided by the 900 horsepower engine underneath here. It means that this 60-ton monster can travel 20 miles an hour across open country, it can climb a 30-degree gradient, and it can cross nine-foot ditches. These, then, are the three principles of every tank, and throughout its short history, its success has depended on getting the right balance between them. It was on battlefields 2,000 miles distant from the Golan and 80 years away in time that the idea of the tank was introduced to the military imagination. The First World War crisscrossed the landscape with barbed wire, trenches, and crater fields. Cavalry, which had won quick victories for 2,000 years, was blown from the battlefield in the first few weeks. The Industrial Revolution had made the cavalryman and his horse obsolete. But it had invented new forms of horsepower that unconventional minds realized could be made to take their place. The Caterpillar tractor, seen here in a film of 1908 advertising its usefulness to the farmer, was one of them. Machines like these took hold of the imagination of soldiers like Ernest Swinton. Appalled by his first sight of the Western Front, his mind turned to the tractor as a way through it. On Christmas Day, 1914, he wrote a requirement for a bulletproof vehicle which would roll down barbed wire by sheer weight and support the advance by machine gun fire it would become the specification for the first tank. This is one of the earliest tanks. It's called the Mark IV and came into service in 1917. Already the three principles are beginning to show up, albeit in rudimentary form. Mobility. On these tracks, it could roll at three and a half miles an hour. For firepower, Hotchkiss machine guns, and further forward, the six-pounder but it was in protection that the British Army was mainly interested. And although its armor was only half an inch thick, it was enough to protect the crew from enemy fire. Fear naught was the motto adopted by the British Tank Corps from the earliest days, in tribute to the tank's bullet-stopping skin. The tank was a revolutionary weapon. To man it on the battlefield demanded a special breed of soldier. One of the pioneers, George Brown, recalls the early days. There was a crew of eight in the tank. There was the driver on the primary gears. The officer sat on his left on the handbrakes. I was a Lewis gunner. There were two Lewis gunners in each sponson, two sponsons on each side of the tank. So it took four men to drive the tank. And the other four men were just gunners. Switch. You were trained to do all, all the jobs. You were trained on the secondary gears, you were trained on the machine guns, you were trained on the six-pounder guns, and, of course, you were trained as a driver. Good. Gun free and block. Check gear stick. Neutral. Check clutch. Stand by to start. Stand up! Move! Come on, pull it! Two! The 
story of the tank can be told by looking at how it has mastered each of its three principles. Protection first, because it was protection the British Army valued highest. Protection for the tank crews and protection for the infantry following the paths that the tank crushed in the barbed wire. Tank was the cover name adopted while the machines were being built for the Great British Offensive on the Somme in 1916. On the first day, none were ready. The British advanced unprotected against the German machine guns and 20,000 British soldiers died. Two months later, with a handful of tanks, the British won the little battle of Flair at far less cost in lives. Once we started to open fire on the Germans, all hell was let loose. High explosive bursting overhead, shells hitting the ground and bursting. When you first opened fire, there was the uh, already the rattle of their machine gun bullets and rifle bullets hitting the side of the tank. And unless they were armor piercing bullets, they didn't penetrate the tank. They just made a dent, that's all. You heard a rattle on the outside. It was like something hitting a tin can. The machine gun bullets didn't penetrate, but they threw off shale on the inside of the tank. And it used to pit the face with tiny bits of steel, you see, and they used to bleed. You came out looking a bit sorry. They felt so well protected. If you had a direct hit, then you can't say anything about it. You've got to suffer that for machine gun fire and that sort of thing. It didn't offer any, any fear at all. Now, your object was to get there and back. You, you, you didn't see any fear. Protection came to obsess the minds of some tank designers. Weight defeats mobility in tank design. That's one of the iron rules. Unless, that is, the size of the gun and ammunition load is reduced. The British Matilda, at the start of World War II, had almost impenetrable armor. But its gun, as a consequence, was practically a toy. The American Sherman avoided this defect. It had a good gun and great mobility. It was indeed almost a perfect design, except for poor protection, as some Sherman crewmen recall. When we first got them, we thought they were a smashing tank. We did take quite a while in readjusting all the inside pieces to suit our individual tastes. No tank is ever made that suits the, the whole crew. So you take some pieces out and throw them away, and you put in other pieces, and you alter things around just to suit yourself. Perhaps the metal was a bit thin. We had uh, extra plates welded on the side, right across the ammunition ports. Of course, if you were slightly sideways to the enemy, I had a beautiful aiming mark. It was all hedgerows. We had to go climb over the hedgerows. And every time we push show our belly, the Germans would fire 30 millimeters into our belly and blow us up, because that was a very vulnerable spot. The tank around us, our power was all steel, but the belly wasn't that thick. So what they did, the engineers designed a prong, and they welded this onto the front of the tank. So instead of going over the hedgerow, we went through the hedgerow. But it was the Russians who first hit upon the perfect compromise between a tank's mobility, firepower, and protection. The result was called the T-34. Its qualities astounded German tank men like Henry Mettelmann. We found the T-34 a very effective weapon. We were frightened of it. Um, when we met it at the first time, they just drove through our lines and we had little chance to shoot them because they have this uh, shape in front, while ours are more straight. You could hit ours better than theirs. When you hit them, the thing went off or, or down below. German crews manning their early tanks thought the design was good. They seemed to me something like iron horses. I was proud to belong to Panzer troops. We got the Panzer III and we got the Panzer IV. I saw them driving around. It's a powerful thing to watch, and I thought, yes, to be a member of such an army. That's something to be proud of. So I was looking forward to training. 
The Panther and later the Tiger were the Germans' answer to their experience of meeting the T-34. They had called for bigger guns and stronger armor and got them in these powerful machines. But however thick the armor, tank men know they are vulnerable to the right shot. I drove several tanks and uh, also worked with the infantry and the supporting units, the tank supporting units. Uh, I personally, I was always happier when I was in a trench or... Uh, that wasn't a nice experience either, but uh, in a trench you could put your head down and you could keep out of the way in a tank you were just sitting there and you were rel relying totally on your luck that you should not be hit. I think when you looked at the poor bloody infantry outside, you felt at times sort of very affectionate towards your tank, this sort of this wonderful steel womb within which you traveled. On the other hand, although that uh, protected you against shell and mortar fire so long as you were inside it, you were, when you moved across open ground, a very large target for the very accurate and effective German guns. And if you had any sort of imagination, you were aware of what would happen when they got you in, in their sights. 